الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, his household, his companions. May Allah bless every one of you, and may Allah bless the ummah at large. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless humanity at large. Amen. My beloved brothers and sisters. As we were seated here before Salatul Maghrib, and we've come here to read Salatul Maghrib, we heard the Adhan being called. You and I know that the Adhan is the call to prayer. In Islam, we have this call that is called out five times a day. And it is unique because generally in other faiths, there is no one calling out before the prayer, say 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, or even just before the prayer, calling out to the people to say, come to the prayer. There are different ways of doing it. One of them is the ringing of the bell, as you may hear from the churches. When it comes to the unique call of Islam, it's very important for us to remind ourselves, and that's what I'm going to do today, what exactly is said and why is it said. So you and I know that the commencement of that adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, beautiful, always so beautiful, so lovely that even those who don't understand it are impacted by it. Those who don't believe in it are impacted by it. Those who might not want to listen to it, subhanAllah, they're impacted by it. Do you know why? It is declaring that the one who made you is the greatest. That's what it is saying. He who made you is the greatest. He whom you are going to return to is the greatest. Can we ever debate that? The answer is no, you cannot debate that. Whoever made you is indeed the greatest. Who made me? Imagine, we are so sophisticated. We have eyes, noses, etc. We have ears. None of it needs tuning. You know, the eyes are just looking. Subhanallah, they adjust to the light, to the brightness. They adjust to the distance and everything. So beautifully, whoever made that is indeed the greatest. 
And who is that? Subhanallah. We call him or he calls himself Allah. But he has a lot of names, a lot of qualities. And you may call him with any one of his names or qualities when you are calling out to him or when you are mentioning his names or qualities. He says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Indeed, Allah has so many beautiful names. So use those names to call out to Him. From this we learn that it is the duty of a Muslim to learn the names of Allah and to use the different names to call out to Allah. Don't just use the name Allah, but use the name Rahman, Rahim, Shafi, Ashafi, etc. Meaning when you're asking for cure, you say, Ya Shafi, Ishfini, for example. When you're asking for sustenance, you say, Ya Razzaq, Urzuqni. You know, O oh, you who is the owner of sustenance, O oh, you who is the owner of cure. So I think we can all make an intention, inshallah, we're going to learn these names. We're going to use them to call out to Allah. We're going to try and understand their meaning because I can share with you another narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, indeed, Inna lillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala tis'atan wa tis'ina isman. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names that if you were to memorize and you were to understand them completely, memorize them, use them to call out to Him, live by them, you would get Jannatul Firdaus just by that. You would get paradise. So we can make an effort to do that. The first step is to know what these names are. The second step is to know the meanings of these names. The third step is to ask yourself, am I living within the meanings of these names? For example, if I say a Shafi is Allah, the owner of cure is Allah. Do I really believe that the owner of cure is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, I will be going to the doctor because I have to. I will be going to, uh, you know, receive medication or I will be going to diagnose what's wrong with me so that I can understand. But I know ultimately it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I'm doing is because Allah has asked me to use the capacity that He's given me in order to achieve, in order to cure yourself by the will of Allah, the owner of cure. So these are some of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we understand them. We actually need to make an effort to understand them in a bigger way and we will be rewarded. So when the Mu'addin calls out to starting that Adhan, he says, indeed, Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. <laughs> Allah is still the greatest, mashallah. <laughs> And one thing I've learned from this is when you declare that Allah is the greatest, you're actually declaring that He is in control of every aspect of existence. He does not do bad things. No, He does good things. We don't understand the goodness in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. We don't understand that goodness because sometimes, say for example, the sound we heard a few moments ago, it's a good example to give. Instead of getting irritated, upset, just enjoy it, subhanallah. Just enjoy it. You know, it was a moment, it's a test for you. It's, it will calm you down, subhanallah, because some of us, we are very temperamental. And we are very impatient. We want things our way. And Allah is telling you, hang on, it's going to happen my way, not your way. I'm going to show you who is in charge. Because Allah is in charge and in control. He knows. Yes, it is the duty of those for example, who might be responsible to try and adjust it quickly, do something about it. Sometimes it's not in our hands. So when you say Allahu Akbar, you're actually handing over or acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in absolute control of every aspect of existence. Sometimes things happen to us that seem negative. You lose a job, for example. You're looking for a job, you can't find one. You're looking for a husband or a wife, you can't really, you know, or you have not yet immediately found your spouse and you're getting frustrated and irritated. Allah knows what is best for you. He is the greatest Allahu Akbar. He is the greatest. Indeed, He knows. Sometimes people are, you know, trying to have children and they cannot. May Allah bless you with offspring. Ameen. Ameen. 
Sometimes people are trying to have children. Allah knows why He has delayed it. Perhaps He will give you Jannah in return. Perhaps He is saving you from something that you don't know. I was reading Surah Al-Kahf the other day and I came across this verse. And every time we come across verses, we need to think over what is being said. And Allah says, وَأَمَّا الْغُلَامُ فَكَانَ أَبَوَاهُ مُؤْمِنَيْنِ فَخَشِيْنَا أَنْ يُرْهِقَهُمَا طُغْيَانًا وَكُفْرًا فَأَرَدْنَا أَنْ يُبْدِلَهُمَا رَبُّهُمَا خَيْرًا مِنْهُ زَكَاةً وَأَقْرَبَ رُحْمًا The story of Musa alayhi salam with Al-Khidr when the one child was actually murdered by Al-Khidr. I'm using the term murdered, but it was the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The life was taken away. And obviously any normal mind would say, what did you just do here? What happened here? Why did you do this? We're not allowed to harm. We're not allowed to take life away. You cannot do that. Life, the giver of life is Allah. Who gives us the permission to take away what was given by the owner, by the giver? The same Allah we say is in control of everything. If He wanted to take that life away, He could have taken it away without our involvement. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the life. So when the question was asked, Musa alayhi salatu was salam was asking the question and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the response in Surah Al-Kahf that you know that child, he, his parents were good and had he grown older, he would have been a means of distress for those parents. He would have been disobedient. He would have been a very bad child. It was the best thing we could have ever done was to take the child away at that stage. And we will replace those, you know, that child with other children for those parents. Now this is Allah. You know what we learn from that verse? That Allah knows I'm sure we understand this. That Allah knows that which happened, that which is happening, that which will happen. And you know what else? That which will never happen. If it were to happen, how it would have happened is also in the knowledge of Allah. Because that child was never ever meant to grow up. Never. Are you following? The child was never meant to grow up. But Allah says, we know had he grown up, this is where it would have ended. That's the knowledge of Allah. It's amazing. So if you were to live till the age of 200, Allah knows what would have happened in that extra time. But Allah also knows you're not going to live up to there. Had you lived, I know where it would have ended. Allahu Akbar. That's the knowledge of Allah. That is the Allahu Akbar. When the Mu'addin calls, this is the greatness of Allah that we're declaring. All these aspects are included. So... This is why we say Allah does not do something bad. We, in our own minds, we think, subhanAllah, this is negative. Allah saved you from something. So don't get angry. Don't get upset with the decree of Allah. Yes, the hadith says, Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. You need to strive towards that which is beneficial for you as a human being, as a Muslim. Strive towards it. And what we are going to give you after that is up to us. For example, you want a job. You cannot just sit at home and say, right, Allah is the greatest every day. You say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And you expect someone to know about you, to understand what qualifications you have, to come to your doorstep, to get you up from your bed and say, hey, I've got a job for you, by the way. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You have to work hard. Allah says, Ihris, the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is relating to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, strive to achieve that which is beneficial for you. Don't be lazy. You know, don't give up. Don't give up. For as long as you're alive, continue striving towards that which is beneficial. So I will go out, I will search, I will be on the net, I will tell people my qualifications, I will try and get a better qualification, I will look for this job, I will apply for that one, I will go for this interview, that interview. And you know what? It might take a few years. But I will inshallah get something. When it comes, I will be so delighted. Wow, subhanallah. Oh Allah, I was so impatient. I want to ask you guys a question. Right now we're seated here, right? We've made countless dua and supplications in our lives. Agree? Okay. 
A lot of the times we feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not answering my dua. But I promise you right now we are living inside the response, the positive response of so many supplications that we have called out to Allah for in the past. And Allah has answered them and we're living in them. But the problem is we've never sat and thought about it. You made the dua. Where were you many years ago? Everyone has a different answer. What did you used to do? Where, what was your condition? What are the du'as that you called out to Allah many, many years back? What were they? You wanted to get married? Guess what? You're married and now you have children as well. So you're living in the response, the positive response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, meaning what Allah has given you as a result of your du'a. Subhanallah. But the difficulty is we keep on renewing our du'a. You have something, you want something else. You have something, you want something else. You get what you wanted, you want another thing. Sometimes you get what you wanted and you realize it. You know what? That's not what I wanted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah forgive us. It happens to man where we cry for something that's not good for us sometimes. We cry for something that is not good for us sometimes. And we keep on asking Allah for it. And we don't know it's not good. And Allah says, look, out of my mercy, I don't want to give you this. Out of my mercy, I know it's bad for you. I don't want to give it to you. And we keep on crying. Then Allah says, out of his mercy, because you're crying so much. He says, okay, I'm going to give it to you. Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya, rahmatullahi alayhi, makes mention of this in his book, Al-Fawaid. And he says, you know what? Sometimes man is in a gift of Allah. And he doesn't realize this is a gift of Allah. He's making a dua and a supplication to come out of the gift of Allah. You know? He's making a dua to come out of the gift of Allah. And Allah says, no, through my mercy, I'm going to keep you where you are because this is the best thing for you. And then Allah says, but he keeps on calling, he keeps on calling. And then when Allah gives him his dua, immediately he says, oh Allah, take me back to where I was. It was a much better condition. Take me back to where I was. Allah says, you see, we told you already. Subhanallah, we told you already. The moral of what I'm saying is, thank Allah. How many of us actually thank Allah for what we have? A lot of us just complain and keep on complaining. Thank Allah. Be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah will take care of your needs. He has and He will. Can I tell you? Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا مِن فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There is nothing that treads this earth except that it is upon Allah to sustain it. Allah has taken the responsibility of the sustenance of everything that moves on the earth. So someone might say, well, I'm looking for a job. I haven't found it. Allah says, hang on, let's think about it. What you need, Allah has provided. What you want, that's yours. Subhanallah, which means Allah may give you, He may not give you. The needs He has given us. Look, today we're sitting here. The clothing you have is expensive. It's not a need. It's not the minimum. The minimum you would have covered yourself with a sheet. Allah gave you the sheet. The food, subhanAllah, you might have avocados growing here in your trees. Australia is a beautiful place. I'm sure it grows. It grows back in Africa and I'm sure it grows here. What's an avocado? People are dying to pay, meaning people are dying for avocados in other parts of the world. If you say we, we have avocado for breakfast, they say, what? You guys are crazy, man. You know, the terminology used today is opposite. The young people, they use opposite the language, you know. When, when something is really good in some cultures, they say, that's sick, man. <laughs> and with us, we don't understand what it means. We think, what's going on? The last time I was in Australia, I remember listening to some of the people talk and I'm like, hang on, it's going to take me a long time before I actually understand what's going on. But Allah provides for you. Allah gives you, Allah has guaranteed you the minimum. More than that, he hasn't guaranteed you, but He may give it to you. He may. But we normally are complaining about that which is over and above the necessity. You follow what I'm saying? We are complaining about that which is above the necessity. You have a house, it's a small house, it has one, two bedrooms, maybe one bedroom. And you know, you are calling out to Allah to give you another. And oh Allah, you're not providing for me, I need. But Allah says, look, look here, the house you're in right now, we gave it to you. SubhanAllah, we provided for you. Did you go hungry? No, you didn't. Well, we gave you whatever you ate. We did not guarantee you that we're going to give you the quality that you are asking for. But we said we're going to provide for you whatever we're going to provide for you. Subhanallah. Still, 
when you get it, thank Allah. And you are allowed and you should be working towards or striving towards that which is beneficial for you. You want a better quality of life, you work towards it, no problem. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. But don't only work for a better quality of life without working for a better quality of hereafter. You follow what I'm saying? Don't only work for a better quality of life to say, I want to get to uh, so many figures of a salary, such type of a house, such type of a car, and such type of living, for example. Forgetting about the hereafter when that living is no more and you get into your grave. What will come with you? Subhanallah, your deeds, your good deeds. When you die, everything leaves you. Your family stays behind, your wealth stays behind. What comes with you? Your a'mal, your deeds. So do as many deeds as you can, good deeds as you can while you're alive. Do as many good deeds you'll never regret. All this is part of the declaration that Allah is the greatest. If Allah is the greatest, He's my creator. He's the one I'm going to return to. I believe that I'm in total and absolute love with this maker of mine. What He's asked me to do, I will do it. What He's asked me to abstain from, I'm going to stay away from it. That's Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. And the declaration of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supreme. It is something that is universal. Anyone who believes in the maker or the deity, the supreme deity, they would have to acknowledge that, you know what? He is indeed the greatest. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. Amen. Let's move on further. Within this adhan, we hear the Allahu Akbar and it's repeated twice at the beginning. In fact, twice by two times. So we hear the Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. Your attention is drawn towards the greatness of Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Have you noticed something? Whenever the adhan is called out, the first two are slightly shorter than the second two. Have you noticed this? A lot of the times the mu'adhin, that's what he does. Did you know that according to some schools of thought, there is something known as tarji' at takbir, which means they say softly and then they say it aloud, they go back and say it soft and aloud to draw your attention to the reality of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you didn't think of it in the first calling, at least in the second one, you're going to think about it. So when you hear the caller call for salah, don't just think, wow, that's the call for salah. Yes, it is. But what's the meaning of it? What is what is said there? Do I fall under this? Do I believe this? Do I live by it? Allah saying, think about it. Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really grant us the value of who he is within us. Amen. So I call on you. Obviously, I could go on and on and on speaking about just Allahu Akbar. But let's move on to the next phrases that are called, said in the Adhan. Because these words are powerful. They are so powerful. They should never be misused and abused. They should never be misused and abused. What is the meaning of misuse and abuse? Look, in all reality, we need to understand that things are happening across the globe. And we find ourselves in a situation where Muslims are being judged because of the actions of others. And what happens sometimes before a person perpetrates a crime, he says, Allahu Akbar, and then a crime is perpetrated. Such that when people hear the term Allahu Akbar who are not Muslim, they think, wow, something bad is about to happen. That's what's happened today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. And may Allah strengthen us so that we can actually add the value of this beautiful term that is so high back into the hearts and the minds, even of those who don't believe. Really, it's a great da'wah. It's a great call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second phrase is, what is the second phrase? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And we say it twice, subhanallah. What am I saying? I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. Have you ever paused and thought for a moment what that means? You know, to enter into the fold of Islam, you need a declaration by tongue, a belief in the heart, and you need to work towards that with your 
organs, right? That's the declaration of deen. You want to enter Islam, you need to utter something, you need to believe it and work towards it. Three things that are required. So why is it so big a statement that it actually makes me enter Islam? When I say, I bear witness that la ilaha illallah, there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. Is that correct? La ma'abuda bihaqqin illallah in the Arabic language. That means there is none truly worthy of worship besides Allah. That's what I believe. That's what I've declared. That's what we've all declared. Why? Why is it such an important statement? Because it is a declaration. And let's go back to the meaning of it. None worthy of worship. Which means I am not going to worship anyone besides Allah. That's what it means. You are declaring, I'm not going to worship anyone besides Allah. Now go back to your life and ask yourself, am I really living by that? Am I really a person who worships none, nothing, be it a stick or a stone or a grave or a tree or anything else besides Allah? Am I one who worships Allah and Allah alone? Some people worship their wealth. Some people their position. Some people worship their free time. One day when, when we have a chance, I can talk about it. I have spoken about it in the past. Some people worship material items because when they are in it, they forget about everything else. Everything is forgotten. Why? No matter what you're doing, no matter how much of luxury you have, don't forget your duty unto Allah. Don't forget that you are answerable to Allah. Don't forget that you are going to return to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to return. You're going to return. Be a better person. Fulfill your duties unto Allah and have such amazing character that everyone who interacts with you understands that you're a godly person. You're a person who's close or you are trying to become closer to your maker. And why should we then be good to others? Because they were made by the same maker. That's something that we need to think about. The people outside who don't share our faith, they don't share anything with us besides the fact that they're human beings. What's the relationship between me and them? Well, I have many relations. One of them is, we were made by the same Allah. He who made me, and I feel so important, made them, so surely they must be feeling so important as well. I need to fulfill their rights. That's also part of how I will go into paradise. So, we declare that we will not worship anyone besides Allah. So don't worship anyone besides Allah. What's the point of saying, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah? But you're worshiping everything besides Allah. You've associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've actually done things not for Allah, but for everyone and everything else. That's not fair. That's not correct. So let's look back into our lives. And every time the adhan is called, ask yourself, Am I the worshiper of Allah alone? Do I worship Allah alone? Subhanallah. If that is the case, yes, you are learning something from the adhan. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It's repeated five times a day. And guess what? It's repeated twice in the adhan, twice in the iqama. Iqama is just prior to the prayer as the, as the lines are being straightened. So four times, five. Twenty times a day, you're hearing the statement, I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. But we don't think of its meaning. A lot of us say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. What does it mean? I will not worship. Anyone besides Allah, I bear witness there is no one worthy, no nobody, nothing is worthy of worship besides Allah. So you put your head on the ground solely and only for Allah, Rabbul Izzati wa Jalal. Then we have the next statement. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Beautiful, amazing. It means I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. Have you thought of what you're saying? You're actually saying that the message from my maker, I bear witness that the one who brought it to me is that man, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Which means whatever he said is a message from the one who made me. It's a message. So have you learned what he said? Are you trying to follow what he said? That's what you need to ask yourself. You're hearing it 20 times a day. I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. Today, if someone sends, say for example, uh, a CEO of a company or a manager sends the, what do they call them? The 
delivery man or the messenger. Call them a messenger. They do call them messengers. He sent a messenger to someone else to deliver something or to give something, a delivery man. What happened? Whatever came to you, you know this is from this company. Here is the, the invoice or the receipt or the D note, the delivery note, etc. And I'm going to look at it and say, wow, this came from the company. I'm excited. My order is here. Okay. Subhanallah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has delivered to us the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah chose him to be afdalul khalqi wa akramul rusul. The best of creation, the most noble of all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you hear his name, you should say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Because he did a great job. He did a great job. And that goes to, you know, subhanallah, I can cry when I think of this. Imagine, we call out 20 times a day that I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah, the most loved by Allah. But guess what? He was an orphan. Subhanallah. That goes to show if you're an orphan, it does not mean Allah hates you. Perhaps he loves you more. Look at that case. He loved him much more. We would call them disadvantaged. Allah says, no, that's my loved one. Look at him. He lost his children during his life. All of them besides one. He lost his sons in infancy and childhood. He lost his daughters when they were slightly older, besides one who outlived him by a few, by a short while. So when our children are taken away, we say, why did Allah do this to us? Whereas the one whom Allah loves the most, whom we declare 20 times a day, he is the messenger. Allah took all of his kids away. He didn't complain. It made him strong. That's the plan of Allah. You've got to go. Subhanallah, we all have to go. Our parents will go, our children will go. Some might go before others, some might go together. That's the decree of Allah. Don't be upset. It happened to those who are better than you. It happened to the best. People might fight you, they might hate you, they might dislike you. Well, some people hated him, some people fought him, some people tried to harm him, etc. It happened to him too. So all these are signs to show it does not necessarily mean Allah is upset with you. Subhanallah. It does not necessarily mean that Allah is angry with you. No. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. Let me learn his life. Let me see why was he chosen as a messenger. Surely he was a great man. He was the greatest. That's why he was chosen as a messenger. Allah made him the greatest. Subhanallah. So I need to learn his life. I need to draw inspiration. I need to follow what he's saying. If I believe that Allah is the creator, the maker, the deity, the only one worthy of worship, and I believe that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of the same deity, I will give him so much importance because I know whatever he brought is what he wants. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So now when you hear the term Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah ask yourself how much am I following this messenger how much do I know how much am I doing to expand my knowledge about what he brought inshallah we can do better we can do better inshallah you know you are so fortunate i was not expecting to even speak here this evening i just arrived moments ago and i came for salatul maghrib and subhanallah here i am we have so many brothers and sisters this is not the case in a lot of the parts of the world. Do you know that? This is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us make sure that we do something about it in a positive way, in a good way. Make the most of your, your opportunities that Allah has blessed you with. I promise you, I promise you and I'm sure you know, even the nations that are Muslim nations, sometimes they do not have as much in terms of freedom and rights that you may be having here. Do you know that? Think about it. And think about it and acknowledge it. And thank Allah and use your opportunities to be a positive contributory to yourselves, your families, and those who are around you. May Allah make us from those who appreciate. May Allah make us from those who fulfill salah. Recently I was in Africa and I come from Africa and I visit many countries in Africa that are poor. And wallahi, I noticed one thing. And I can tell you a fact. The poorer the nations, the closer they are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I, 
visited a very poor place, Salatul Fajr. Before the Adhan, there was no place in the masjid. They told me, if you want to enter the masjid for Salatul Fajr, sorry, you're going to need to come 20 minutes prior to the Adhan. I promise you, my, right now, while I'm talking to you, my hairs are standing. Because I think to myself, look, when we have more, we forget about Allah. We indulge sometimes in such a way that I forgot. What did I tell you moments ago? I said, don't let your seeking of this worldly life make you forget about the life after death. You need to make sure you work towards it. Fulfill your salah with enthusiasm. People say, my children are not obeying. My children are not interested in the deen. It's like, that's maybe because whatever you do, you're considering it a burden. You get up for salat al-fajr last minute. You snooze the clock 20 times before you got up. Five minutes, you mean, Allah, Allah, what did the children see? They watched you doing your gymnastics. They didn't know it was salah. They didn't know it was salah. But imagine if you get up, you're smiling, beautiful, the place is smelling good, you're up early and everything is fresh. They will start at a certain age to mimic, to follow you. They will want to do it the way you do it. They will see the beauty in your face, in your system. So get up and do that. When you obey Allah's instruction, do it with enthusiasm, with happiness, with joy, with a smile on your face. And wallahi, it will help your offspring. It will help those around you, those whom you live with. Subhanallah. So, you know, in the Quran, Allah tells us in more than one place different wordings, but I'll mention one of the verses. Allah says, <laughs> If you are to turn away from Allah, from His message, from His instruction, Allah says, He will replace you with someone else who will not be like you. Wallahi, I've seen this. I've seen this with my eyes. And it's brought tears to my eyes. Where? Sometimes you go to a Muslim nation where people are turning away from the deen. They are no longer dressing modestly, for example. Or they've given up some of the values they've had. And you know what? You witness people in rural Africa, out of nowhere. They're practicing the deen in the most beautiful way. And you think to yourself, these have replaced those. It happens. Anyone who abandons their level of closeness to Allah, someone else is getting closer to Allah as a result of that abandonment. For Allah to show you on the day of judgment, you were replaced by this man. You were replaced by that person. Where do we get this from? The Quran tells us, you shall be replaced. We don't need you, you need us. That's what Allah says. Subhanallah. Do you want to be replaced? Ask yourself. If not, good use your energy your power your capacity your wealth whatever you have to do good subhanallah if you're going to sin there are others who will not sin as a result of your sin because you've late you turned away from allah so allah says well step the neck we've changed you with someone else may allah protect us may allah help us may allah grant us forgiveness may allah strengthen us ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah and then you have a beautiful, beautiful statement that's uttered. Direct call to you. Why? Listen to the call. MashaAllah. <laughs> Amazing. Doesn't it do something to you? Subhanallah. Do you know what it is? Iqamat al hujja alayk. That's what it is. Allah is actually recording a statement against you. What is it? Against your name. Did you hear it? Yes. What did you do about it? Well, I just said Adhan was called. That's it. And I ran away. Allah says, wait. Why do you have to repeat 20 times a day? Hayya ala salah. Come for salah. Because Allah is saying, we want you to hear it so that tomorrow we will ask you about it. Did you hear it? Yes, I did. The masjid. Some people say it was so irritating, it disturbed my sleep. Have you heard people say that? Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. 
Hang on, we did you a favor. We're reminding you there's a duty unto Allah. It's a beautiful favor. Imagine, subhanallah, if an earthquake's about to come and someone tells you there's a, an earthquake that's about to come, what will happen? You'll consider it a favor. You will evacuate, you will leave. You will tell your loved ones and everyone else, let's go because someone has warned us about something. Well, Allah gives us good news. He says, come for prayer. So now people might become lazy, right? And they might think, okay, what's there for me in that prayer? It's like when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they were asked to sacrifice the animals, they did. You know, for the Eid, Eid al-Adha. They sacrificed the animals following the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did. But you know what? They asked a question, مَا لَنَا فِيهَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ بِكُلِّ صُوفَةٍ حَسَنَةٍ وَبِكُلِّ شَعْرَةٍ حَسَنَةٍ It's a narration. You know, some may have spoken about the narration, but we're trying to benefit from the answer to the question. They asked, what is it? What do we have in it? I am saying, sometimes people might subconsciously ask, okay, I'm going to read Salah. What do I have in it? You know, today people want to know what's in it for me. You tell the guys, let's go. We want to go to perhaps, uh, you know, this place or this city. They say, what's in it for me? What am I getting? They say, well, you're going to earn yourself $10,000. Ah, I'm there. I'm there. Right? right? 10,000 bucks. That's a lot of money. I'm there. But if, you say, if someone says, no, nah, we'll give you five bucks. Nah, it's okay, give someone else. Okay? So you might ask subconsciously because of your weakness. We've heard hayya ala salah. So what's there in it for me? So now you can hear the next statement. Hayya ala al-falah. Come to success. You come to prayer, you will succeed. Succeed in this world and the next. It will, it will make your day better, more productive because you got up early and you slept early. Subhanallah. After Salat al-Isha, you went to bed. And Salat al-Fajr, you were awake. Even if you did not get up for that which was voluntary, such as tahajjud, we're weak. Try it out sometime, by the way. Try it out sometimes, by the way. Get up, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, you know. Start off that way, perhaps. Once in a while, if you're awake, you know, make dua to Allah. At that time, you know, uh, the hadith says, يَنزِلُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ حِينَ يَبْقَى ثُلُثُ اللَّيْلِ الْأَخِيرِ فَيَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ تَائِبٍ فَأَتُوبَ عَلَيْهُ وَهَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَأَغْفِرَ لَهُ وَهَلْ مِنْ سَائِلٍ فَأُعْطِيَهُ But the people are sleeping. When Allah is calling out, saying, at the, at the moment when the third of the night is remaining and he says, is there anyone seeking forgiveness from me? I can forgive them, that I will forgive them. Is there anyone calling out to me or returning to me that I can give them what they want or accept their repentance? People are snoring. And sometimes you're awake because of some reason. But guess what? You're just watching football. <laughs> yeah, you're watching boxing. You're watching rugby. You're watching something. Wait, relax. Be conscious of the time. This is the last third of the night. Let me call out to Allah. It's not a condition to make tahajjud. Allah says, Hal min sa'ilin. Is there anyone asking me? So ask Allah. Say, yes, I'm asking you. I'm here, I'm awake. It's the third of the night. Ask Allah. Become conscious of the time. And mashallah, if you want to read tahajjud, it's the bonus. It's encouraged. Alhamdulillah. It's not compulsory, but it's encouraged. You will see how good you feel. When you put your head on the ground, you feel beautiful. You feel amazing. Why? Because that is the worship of the one who made you. You have to feel amazing. Don't you agree the day you get up for Salat al-Fajr and you're early and you made wudu and you're looking forward to it and you come and you say, Allahu Akbar, you finish Salat al-Fajr, you walk out of the masjid and that day just goes so well. You feel so good about things. Mashallah, mashallah, right? Because you know that's the worship of the one who made you. He's the one who made you, subhanAllah. They, can't be, they cannot be anything better than that. Worshipping Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is telling you, come to success. You want to succeed in this world and in the next. Who does not want success? None of us. We all want it. So you want success, there's a way. Start with developing your relationship with the owner of success. He owns success. You want sustenance, you want a job. You want children, you want to get married. You want to 
Achieve whatever, Allah is the owner of it. Call out to Him. By doing what? Come to success. Start off with your salah. What's the point of someone calling out to Allah? Oh Allah, grant me, I love you, I really love you, you're my maker. Come time for salah, they're heading in another direction. You didn't fulfill your salah. Oh Allah, you know I'm weak. I know you know I'm weak. And I know you're a forgiving person. I heard you are Rahman, you are Rahim, you are Ghafoor, you are Wadood. Oh Allah, you are loving. Love me. Oh Allah, I'm weak. I haven't yet did my salah, but you know, it's okay. You know. Relax, take it easy, understand, you're not supposed to be thinking that way. It's not fair. It's not fair to say, oh Allah, you are loving, so now just excuse my sin. No. Try your best to do what Allah wants from you. Like I said, if you don't, you're replaced. If you didn't come to the masjid, someone else is there already. When you go to the masjid for Salatul Fajr, don't you see some people there already? Well, those were the ones Allah chose them to be there. Why don't you say, oh Allah, choose me to also be there and make an effort about it. Like I said, don't just sit in bed, say, oh Allah, choose me. And then you expect someone to come in from the ceiling, take you to the masjid. It's not going to happen. They're not going to take you that way. You have to make an effort. Allah says, we gave you a car, we gave you energy, we got you up at the time. And this is something disastrous. You know, with me, I'm talking myself, it happens sometimes that you're up before the alarm, right? And then you tell yourself, okay, let me see. There's still a bit of time. Let me sleep. You know what? No, 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 no. You're up slightly before the alarm. Get up. Thank Allah. Do the dhikr of Allah. Turn off the alarm before it even rings. And you can actually say, Allah got me up. Subhanallah. Allah got you up for salah. Do you know that? He, your eye opened. Who was in control? It was Allah. Something happened. Whatever. You got up. Don't be lazy. Remember, you will be asked, didn't we get you up? You know when you go and read the verses which speak about, say for example in Surah Al-Zumar, towards the end, the verses speak about the people who will go to heaven in groups, the people who will go to hellfire in groups, the angels at the door of hell will be asking the people entering hellfire, saying, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ رُسُلٌ مِّنْكُمْ يَتْلُونَ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ رَبِّكُمْ وَيُنذِرُونَكُمْ لِقَاءَ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا They will say, didn't the messengers come to you to read the verses of Allah to you, warning you about this day? And the people say, yeah, actually they did. بَلَا وَلَكِنْ حَقَّتْ كَلِمَةُ الْعَذَابِ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ Subhanallah. They will say, yeah, they did. But you know what? Unfortunately, the punishment was meant to get to them. They were lazy. They heard the message, but they didn't want to do something about it. Let's not be from those. You hear a message, do something about it. Have it in your heart, inshallah, I will do something. I am going to do it right now. I always say, when you hear something that motivates you, it moves you, you feel good about the message. Decide there and then to change. Don't say, inshallah, tomorrow, you know. I've got one last meeting with my girlfriend tomorrow, then I'll see after that what happens. No! Now, decide, oh Allah, it's wrong, I cut it. It's for your sake, and I'm going to be the best possible person. You know, closeness to Allah, and I'm going to repeat this, and I've kept repeating it. Closeness to Allah is picked up by the goodness in your character. You want to know if you're close to Allah? It's very easy. Yes, you are fulfilling your obligations unto Allah, that will show in your character. The way you talk to people, the way you interact with people, the way you treat the weakest of the lot, how you treat that person is who you are. The weakest of the lot. How, how much importance do you give a guy whom the world considers unimportant, the most insignificant person according to the world? How you treat that person is exactly who you really are in terms of character. So you want to know if you are on if you have the greatest of character, you need to know the, the one whom the world doesn't look at because of how insignificant the world thinks that person is. Do you greet them? Do you acknowledge them? Do you reach out to them? Do you smile at them? Do you make them feel important? If that's the case, mashallah, you're a good person. But if you also <laughs> spit at their side, astaghfirullah, cannot do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So, you want success? You know how to achieve it. The first step is developing your relation with Allah. There's no other way to succeed, neither in the dunya nor in the akhirah. Let me quickly give you one more explanation. Sometimes in this world, we get a lot. We become wealthy. We become a person of position. Allah's blessed us with good looks and everything nice. MashaAllah. 
sometimes that is a burden. Sometimes that will be the means of punishment. Why? You don't have a relation with Allah. Allah says, hang on, we gave you not to bless you, to punish you with it. Allah says some people, we give them children to punish them through those children. Verses of the Quran. Sometimes Allah says that we give people wealth in order to punish them with that wealth. فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبَوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Certain groups, Allah said, when they forgot Allah, we opened all the doors for them. حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْتَةً فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْلِسُونَ when they became indulged in what we gave them, so happy that they felt this was it. Allah says, we suddenly punished them. They were confused. Why confused? One hand, they thought, oh, we're getting, it's a blessing of Allah. But because they were far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah punished them, they said, how come Allah's punishing us? But He gave us everything. Allah says, the, the fact that we give you does not necessarily mean that we're happy with you. And the fact that we've taken away from you does not necessarily mean that we're punishing you. It all depends on you and your relationship with Allah. Hayya ala al-falah. You want real success? Come to it. Start off with your link with Allah through salah. Salah. That's why the hadith says the first thing you will be asked about after you've died, the first thing you, you're going to be asked about is your salah. If the salah was good, everything else will be easy. The salah was not in order. Wow, may Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Brothers and sisters, let's try. Let's try, inshallah. We try to be the best. I want to mention a quick phrase that's repeated only in Salatul Fajr. And we know it. What does it say? As-salatu khayrun minan naw. Subhanallah. Prayer is better than sleep. Have you ever thought why? Because sleep is a gift of Allah that is such that when you get into it, sometimes you become so lazy to even get up. Subhanallah. Not realizing that if you want to prepare for the final sleeping that you're going to be going through, then you better wake up right now. A day will come when you're not going to be waking up. So you want to prepare for the day. How many have passed on? How many have passed away while... They were in their sleep. They didn't get up the following morning. Imagine if you didn't even set your alarm or you didn't even plan to read Salatul Fajr and you died. No one wants to die in that condition. But if you plan that you're going to read Salatul Fajr and you've already passed away and the alarm goes off and it's ringing and you're gone. Don't you think you're going to get the reward of that Salah? Don't you think you're going to get the reward of that Salah? You have to because you planned it and it was all ready and waiting. He says, Allah took you away. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this is why it's repeated at Salatul Fajr because the coziness of the sleeping needs a little bit more in terms of encouragement for you to get out. Salatul Fajr. It's not easy. Watch the masajid. Go for Salatul Jum'ah, packed. Go for Salatul Eid, packed. Go for the other salawat, slightly less. Go for salatul fajr. The real believers are there. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from them. The real believers are there. Salatul fajr. MashaAllah. And sometimes I know some of you must be thinking, okay, yeah, I do read, but I read at home, you know, the masjid. Well, at least you need to read. You need to make sure that you're fulfilling it as a beginning point. And after that, you can get to the next level, inshallah, to try and do it with jama'ah, because you have to. I, sometimes if the masjid is distant, you may have an excuse. I'm not too sure about the distances here, but from what I've seen, it seems like sometimes places are very, very far. But guess what? Allah's given you a vehicle as well. He's given you means as well. Try, try your best, inshallah. Earn the pleasure of Allah. You'll find what your children do as a result. They see you enthusiastically leaving every morning, going, coming back, going. You say, Dad, can I join you? You should say, Alhamdulillah. Yes, my son, come, let's go. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy for us. So that's the extra reminder for Salatul Fajr. And then we have something interesting. At the end of the Adhan, there is a repetition of Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. A repetition of it taking you back to remind you. It's like within brackets. You know, if you put a, 
brackets in the English language or in, in, when you're writing things, you put in something in brackets, there's a bracket at the beginning, a bracket at the end. Whatever was in the middle, important. But the bracket is what gave it that importance to say, you know what, don't forget this statement. Because I'm writing a sentence in the middle, I put two brackets, which means, hey, you need to read this as well. Allah starts off by declaring His greatness. He ends by declaring His greatness and a statement beyond La ilaha illallah. There is none worthy of worship besides Allah. Initially we said, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And at the end we are saying there is definitely none worthy of worship besides Allah. And He is indeed the greatest. Imagine, you've now fulfilled your salah. You're now heading towards success. You become stronger in your declaration of the greatness of Allah. And you become stronger. You realize that not only do I bear witness, but indeed Allah is the greatest for everyone. Even those who don't believe in Allah, Allah is still the greatest. You know, when someone does not believe in the Almighty, it doesn't reduce the value of the Almighty. It does not reduce the value of the Almighty. It reduces the value of that person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and a deep understanding. I've spoken for 52 minutes, alhamdulillah. And my brothers and sisters, it's been an honor to be here. I hope the message that I've said can actually be of benefit to myself and to yourselves. And I hope every time you hear the Adhan, even if it is just on an application on your phone, you take it seriously. You try and understand what's being said here and where do I fit in? Am I really a person who understands that Allah's calling me and this is going to be used against me? You know, we get excited without... Have you got the Adhan app? Yes, I do. Have you got the Salah time app? Yes, I do. I'm sure most of us do. Am I right? Yes, there you are. Well, it's a problem. It's a problem because in a good way. You might be thinking, how can a problem be a problem in a good way? Let me explain. It will help you regarding reminding you for salah, but it will come on the day of judgment to bear witness for you or against you. Remember that. Remember that. It might look like a phone, like an app. Subhanallah. If it reminded you, it's going to be there to say, you know what? Yes, I did remind this guy about salah. Well, what did he do? He just clicked snooze and he was sleeping every day. If you made a mistake one day, two days, it's one of those things. You know, <laughs> If ever anyone sleeps over a salah or forgets it completely, they should read it as soon as they remember it. Those are the words of Rasulullah But, but you cannot say, oh, I know the hadith, let me just sleep. It's okay, I'm sure, you know, my name will be written because I'll have slept over it. Come on, you cannot find justification for your 